Hi there, I'm Jen Stover, founder of the Human Infusion Project. And in this class, I'm gonna share some simplified insights as well as some practical tips and suggestions on the subject of human needs and how we can start getting our needs met in healthier, higher quality ways. As many of you may know by now, the mission of the Human Infusion Project is to give more people access to what I consider to be essential mental wellness education. That way, people from a variety of income levels can learn and apply the skills that we really need to improve our relationships and live healthier, happier lives, which is pretty much what we're all looking for, right? Now, if this is the first time that you're joining us, welcome. I'm really glad you're here. So let's get going. I'll share my screen and we'll get started. As a very brief overview, the Human Infusion Project's main goal is to show you a way to sustainably change unhelpful thought and behavior patterns by strengthening and training your mind and body, and then positioning your core values or what's most important to your life as guideposts for how you live. Similar to the whole brain relationships class that we did last fall, tonight's presentation is designed to help you see the connection between two of these interlocking aspects, psychology, and science, or said another way, the connection between your mind and your body. Now, if you're wondering how and where spirituality fits in, I do include mindfulness practice throughout the change process. But to be honest, my ability to connect to or really experience that more energetic essence within me or what others might call their higher power or spiritual nature, it really only started to develop after the state of my body and mind had started to recenter itself. That's the best way I can describe it. So this is why I approach change through the mind and body first, to sort of create the conditions to really take it to the next level if you want to. And even if you don't, you're gonna feel a whole lot better in the process. So this class, along with the whole brain relationships course, is part of stage one of what I call the integrative change pathway. And in this stage, we're first learning how our brains and bodies work. Then in future classes, I'll walk you through ways to uncover thought patterns that may be blocking you. I'll walk you through some ways to strengthen and integrate your brain and retrain your emotional response. I'll show you some of the relational skills that have really made a difference in my own life. And then I'll show you how I started tapping into my more energetic core as a primary source of drive. Whole brain intelligence and the complete experience of being a human being is really what we're working towards here. And we're starting by understanding some of the basics about how these physical brains and bodies work. Now, human needs are important to understand for a couple of reasons. First, because needs are something we all share and are trying to get met, even if some of us are going about it in unskilled or low quality ways. So it's a common bond between us. And once you understand how your needs influence your own behavior, it can kind of change the way you look at other people's behavior too. Next, what we call our psychological or emotional needs actually have a physical or physiological component to them. And understanding this connection between the mind and the body can not only be inspiring, but it can give you the objectivity that's needed to really make lasting change happen. We all have a harder time changing things that we personalize and heavily identify with. This is why we have no problem telling other people how to paint their fence or mow their grass, but can sometimes struggle to listen to ideas about our own landscaping. It's just a yard. But sometimes we forget that. It's similar with our brains and bodies. If we can be a bit more objective about how they operate, it becomes a lot easier to make the changes we want and stick with it through the more difficult stages. Plus, I want to help you to see that pattern change is something we each already have experience with. We've probably all learned a skill that required coordination or that changed the shape of our body or impacted our blood pressure in some way. 
Those are all examples of physical pattern changes you've probably already experienced. So if I can show you the physiology behind your emotional needs, it just may help you see that changing your life experience really is in part about physically creating new brain patterns and physiologically retraining your body to respond in more helpful and unifying ways. So that's what today's presentation is about, helping you see the connection between the mind and the body as we answer the following questions. What exactly are human needs? I mean, we hear that term a lot, but what does it mean? What are the primary emotional neurochemicals that represent these needs in the body? How do these two seemingly different things actually go hand in hand? And how does the quality and the number of ways that we get our needs met really make a difference in our relationships with our health and in how we experience life in general? Now, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on history, but many of you are probably aware that there have been several needs models that have been used over the decades to try and describe what motivates us or drives our behavior. From Maslow's and McClellan's in the 40s and 50s to Alderfer's models in the 70s, as well as modern day spinoffs or ones made popular by public speakers or coaches like Tony Robbins or Christine Comfort. And what's important to note about all of them is they are just that, models. A way of looking at something that we are still learning a lot about. I like to think of a model as sort of a tool that we can use to navigate and function in a world that's sometimes very complex and confusing. And as some of you may have already figured out, there can be several models that describe the exact same thing and they're always evolving. So what's most important is that you find a model that you can use, sort of like a tool, to get the outcomes that you want, whichever model that is. I also want you to understand that these fundamental needs that we're gonna talk about can vary in priority at different stages in your life. Now, initially, when some of these earlier models were first published, it was suggested that there was some sort of order to meeting these needs, like you couldn't get certain needs met before others. But later, several of the authors came back, including Maslow, changed their stance and clarified that getting our needs met is an ever-shifting dynamic process of prioritization. In other words, at different stages of your life, it may be more important to get some needs met before others, but that doesn't mean that they can't be met at any time. I think this will become a little bit more clear as we go along. So with that in mind, the six need model that I'm using today is one I use because it's simple. It captures the essence of several of the other models. And because of the language it uses, I can more easily show you how they connect to your physical body. So let's take a quick first glance at these six basic human needs so we can see why getting them met for us is like such a big deal. And then we'll go over them in more detail. The need for certainty or safety. This is the assurance we can avoid pain and gain pleasure. It's our need for predictability or consistency. Number two, the need for variety and novelty. This is our need for stimulus, change, or the unknown. Number three, the need for significance. This is our need to be seen, feel appreciated, and feel like we matter or that we're needed. Number four, the need for connection and love. This is our need for closeness or union with another person or another living being. The need for growth. This is our need for expansion of our capacity, expansion of our capability, or increase in our understanding. And lastly, the need to contribute. This is our need for a sense of service, to feel like we're helping or giving to and supporting other people. Now, the tricky part is many of these needs can be met in both high quality, helpful ways, as well as lower quality, more destructive ways. We'll talk more about that as we go along. 
Now let's take a closer look, starting with the first one, because certainty or safety is definitely a need that we spend a lot of time trying to get met, whether you're aware of it or not. And we go about it in ways that you may not have thought of. At first glance, we can see that something being certain, something that's for sure or guaranteed is what we call safe. We only feel unsafe when we don't know what's gonna happen or something is uncertain, right? So a need for certainty is another way of saying that we need to feel safe. Now let's go down into the body and think about what we learned in the whole brain relationships class. What's the body state or the neurochemical that's active during the fight or flight response or when we're afraid of something? Adrenaline, because we need it to move in some way to fight or run. So adrenaline is the neurochemical of fear or uncertainty. And what's the opposite of feeling scared? Feeling safe, certain, or not scared. In other words, when we don't have fear, we feel calm. So if fear is represented by high adrenaline in the body, safety or feeling calm is represented by less adrenaline activation or having more of a calming agent that we'll go over in a minute. So what I want you to understand from that is that what we mentally label as our need for certainty or safety corresponds to our physical need to feel calm or have less adrenaline running in our bodies. I'm gonna say that again. What we call our psycho-emotional need for certainty or safety is our physiological need to feel calm or having less adrenaline running in our bodies. Are you tracking me? We need to feel safe. And since calm is the state of the body when we are safe, from a body standpoint, what we're describing here is a need for calm. And later, we're going to look at the many ways that humans go about trying to get this need for calm met, some of which are helpful and healthy strategies and others, well, not so much. But underneath it all, what I want you to understand is that whether behaviors are helpful or destructive, they represent an attempt to meet the same human needs that we all share. And if we're talking about the human need for certainty, the behavior is about trying to feel safe or moderately calm in our bodies in some way even if the way we go about it is low quality and not highly skilled. Next, let's look at the need for variety or novelty. Now, after what we just went over, a need for variety or newness sort of seems like it might be contradictory to certainty or like it would cancel it out, right? But in actuality, as we learned in the last course, part of our brain actually needs a mix of both of these two experiences. Our brain not only needs a mix of complementary experiences like thinking and sensing, intellect and emotion, it also needs a mix of safety and stimulus or certainty with variety. And we sort of already know this experientially. If you do the same thing over and over, what happens? We eventually feel bored, which is another way of saying that we're not getting enough of a need of novelty, variety, or stimulus met. This is why taking a vacation somewhere new is so great. It's stimulating to us or meeting a need for variety from our typical routine. And when the opposite happens, like if you always travel as part of your job, what can happen after a while? We sort of crave our own bed and our own food and stuff that's familiar, certain, and safe. See what I'm saying? In other words, our brain actually needs or requires a mix of safe and different, or a mix of certainty and novelty. So now let's take a look at significance. This need sort of makes sense from a cooperative survival standpoint. In other words, as humans at a primitive level, we're designed with a brain and body that is designed to help us stay alive, stay safe, and keep our species going. So when we feel significant, that means we matter to someone other than just ourselves. We're part of and contribute to a group of some kind. 
whether it's an organization, a couple, a family, or a community, which is safer and increases our chances, our chances of finding a mate. Let's keep going. The need for connection and love. Now, some of you may wonder, why is it meeting the need for significance enough? I mean, significance by itself sort of provides safety as well as species survival, right? Yet we still have that need to feel seen, accepted, united, or bonded with someone in ways beyond just what our skills can provide and beyond just making babies. Now, many of us may have grown up with inconsistent or conditional love or a connection that fell apart with our caregivers. And if it happened at a time when our emotional nervous system was still learning how to work and when to turn up and down, instead of learning how to experience love and connection in healthy and safe ways, many of us instead learn to distrust or fear love and it fear connection because it wasn't stable or reliable when we were first learning about it. And then over time, our brains and bodies just adopt that fear-based, unstable emotional response as its automatic way of doing things. And then as we grow up, the uncomfortable body sensation of fear gets registered with the meaning that all love is unsafe, inconsistent, or unreliable, which can make us cautious, skeptical, or reluctant to trust it. Even if logically we know that loving, reliable people must exist in a world of nearly 8 billion people. So until we retrain our emotional nervous system and update that associated meaning, the current state of your brain and body may be part of what's blocking you from getting this need for love and connection met. Now, growth and contribution are two needs that many scholars feel are sort of higher level needs, needs that become more of a priority once the other needs are met. However, meeting these needs is not age or life stage dependent. If you're someone who was fortunate enough to get your needs consistently met in a variety of high quality ways early in life, and you know how to get them met now, then you may find yourself prioritizing growth and contribution at a much younger age. However, many people confuse the need for growth with the need for stimulus and variety. Think about that. We may believe that constantly learning, achieving, reading, and moving on from challenge to challenge is growth, but is it? Or are those activities meeting a need for novelty and stimulus? For some people, continually learning, setting goals, and achieving is a way to offload, distract from, or calm down unmoderated adrenaline that's activating too often, too intensely, or disproportionately. For people with this nervous system, constantly learning, reading, and achieving is actually soothing. And so meeting a need for calm or safety. See what I'm getting at? What seems like growth on the surface can even be an attempt to gain significance or be part of a growth-minded group, like on Facebook. There's no wrong answer to any of these questions, just questions worth pondering to understand what specific need you're actually trying to get met with your behaviors. The reason this matters is that because we can be much more effective with our change work once we understand the real root of our unhelpful behaviors, the meaning that's tied to them, and what unmet need it's really trying to meet. So now let's take a deeper look at how these psychological needs are represented in the body. Let's start with the hormones and neurochemicals that we read about more often and that we sort of know are part of the emotional response. And then we'll talk about how we can get our needs met in healthy, higher quality ways. So here are five of the better known neurochemicals and hormones that feel good to us. Dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, and acetylcholine, as well as a few that don't feel so great, especially in larger prolonged doses, adrenaline and cortisol. Now, despite their bad boy reputations, both adrenaline and cortisol still have important functions, but only when they're activated in small to moderate amounts and in the right situations. More on that in a minute. But right now, let's talk more about dopamine, 
the motivation, pleasure, and goal achievement neurochemical. Who doesn't love dopamine? It feels great. And so this highly pleasurable sensation helps motivate us towards our goals and gets us to take action towards achieving that goal. And when we do, we get a heightened pleasurable body sensation followed by a sense of relief from achieving it. So who wouldn't want more of that? <laughs> In moderate amounts, dopamine also helps us to enjoy food, exciting events, and to enjoy our relationships in general. However, research has also shown that self-doubt, lack of enthusiasm, and procrastination to also be associated with low levels of dopamine. So if we aren't getting enough dopamine, we'll feel less inclined to make an effort. Then what, then what do we do? We end up cramming to do something last minute and get both a deadline-induced adrenaline rush plus a dopamine hit if we do get it done. And as many of us know from our college days, that route can be exhausting. But when dopamine levels are moderate to high, we work harder towards our goals more, more sustainably. Dopamine is also called the instant gratification chemical because it's powerful, easy to activate, but it's a short feel-good sensation. That's the problem. It doesn't last long which is why dopamine plays a big part in the formation of both our good and bad habits. We're looking for that constant resupply of short lasting dopamine effects. Video game creators know this about the brain and intentionally incorporate, incorporate the activation of dopamine into their game designs. That way you keep playing. It's the same for slot machines. The problem is if we solely rely on dopamine, as our only way to feel good and get relief. Similar to a drug addiction, we're gonna be working constantly to find repeated doses. And over time, it takes more and more of it to get the same effect. So we need to be mindful of this powerful neurochemical so we don't get hooked on habits that can be destructive to our health and our relationships. Next up, oxytocin, the bonding and trust building hormone. One of the most important aspects about the release of oxytocin is not just that it feels good, but because it's critical to developing intimacy and trust within any relationship. Oxytocin provides a much longer period of feeling good and feeling safe compared to the short-term effects of dopamine. So once you learn how to activate it, the longer lasting boost of oxytocin can actually help counter the addictive qualities of dopamine. Both men and women release oxytocin through any kind of interpersonal touch or affection, especially long hugs. Oxytocin is also released during orgasm and during breastfeeding. But oxytocin is not exclusive to only female parents. In fact, in a 2014 study, researchers found that in two bonded male parents, the oxytocin level of the primary male caregiver was no different compared to all female or male-female parents. Also, if long-term relationships are important to you, some studies suggest that increased oxytocin levels are related to increased monogamy within pairs. But whether you're living solo or have a partner, giving someone a hug for no particular reason, well, hey, it can't help but improve your mood through oxytocin. So there's a definite, definitely a, a good reason to become a hugger. All right, next up, serotonin, the community and status neurochemical. Serotonin not only helps with sleep and keeps our bowels regular, but it reduces depression and regulates anxiety. Serotonin is also released whenever you feel significant, important, or when you're part of a group. Loneliness and depression can occur when serotonin is low or absent. Many current antidepressants work by blocking or slowing the reabsorption of serotonin so that more of it remains in the bloodstream and your brain can access it for longer periods of time. However, you can also activate serotonin production without medication or drugs, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Endorphins the pain and stress maskers. 
Endorphins help alleviate anxiety by activating when we're in pain or experiencing stress. That's the surge of energy or second wind that you feel, even though you're really exhausted. Runners can experience a sort of euphoric high at a certain point in long distance events. Endorphins act a little bit like morphine, which is a pain reliever and a sedative that decreases your perception of pain. But another more pleasant benefit of endorphin is that it also is released in small to moderate amounts with anticipation of something new or unknown. It's sort of a response to heightened awareness. Acetylcholine, that's our calming neurotransmitter. And it's designed as a complement or a balance to our fight or flight system. It helps us to come down from an adrenaline surge once a life threat is no longer present. It sort of acts like a braking system to our body's accelerator of adrenaline. We can tell that acetylcholine has been activated when we feel calm, safe, and relaxed. It's also activated through the vagus nerve, which runs from the brain, head, and neck down into our bodies and many of its internal organs. We covered the vagus nerve in a lot more detail in the whole brain relationships class. But what I want you to know today is that it can be intentionally activated quite quickly through deep breathing because the vagus nerve has attachments to our diaphragm, which lays at the base of our lungs. Acetylcholine can also be activated through meditation, not only because of deep breathing, but because our focus is away from our thoughts and onto our body sensations. Anything that uses our senses can activate acetylcholine. And this calming agent is also activated with eating because the vagus nerve also connects to the stomach. So that's sort of the more technical reason why we feel more relaxed or calm after a meal and why we call it comfort food. Our stomach expands when it's full and pushes on the vagus nerve which in turn activates acetylcholine. And as we'll go over in just a bit, this can become problematic if eating is the only way to calm yourself down and feel safe. Adrenaline. This hormone is also called norepinephrine. And as we mentioned earlier, it's designed to get us to take action and move when we're in danger. It's the classic fight or flight chemical designed to prep our muscles to move so that we can either fight or run from an eminent life threat. And if you've ever experienced an intense adrenaline activation without being able to move your body, you know how painful and uncomfortable it can be. Now, the great part about adrenaline is that in small to moderate doses, it's also activated with enthusiastic play, hearty laughter, and when we're really having fun. But if our emotional nervous system learned to operate in a way where adrenaline was turning on frequently at high volume and for all sorts of reasons, and if it learned to stay turned on longer than it was designed to, not only is that anxious state a highly uncomfortable experience, but it can impact our health by increasing how much cortisol we produce, which we'll talk about next. So this is why early in our lives, many of us learned ways to cope with or manage unmoderated adrenaline, either through controlling our environment to minimize or avoid anything that might activate it further, or finding ways to either offload it or numb ourselves from feeling it. And then our bodies just adopted that activation pattern as its default. Cortisol, that's the regulator. Now, cortisol gets a bad rep because of its impact on our health when it's activated in large amounts. But like any of our emotional responses, in small and appropriate amounts, cortisol actually serves some very helpful purposes. It regulates blood sugar, reduces inflammation, regulates our metabolism, and it helps us wake up in the morning. So if you wake up in the morning and you get that kind of jolt of what feels like anxiety in the morning, it's your brain's way of doing what it's supposed to do with cortisol, but at a much higher dose. That's when cortisol can start to impact our health. Large amounts of cortisol or big dumps of it 
come after prolonged, intense, or frequent adrenaline activation. This is why the way our brains and bodies routinely respond to stress can wreak havoc on the body. If adrenaline is constantly activating or activating for too long, then larger than usual amounts of cortisol are going to be dumping into our system. So now let's do a quick review of those six main psychological needs we talked about earlier and see how each one has a physical, emotional, neurochemical response that can sort of go along with them in our bodies. Basically what we're doing here is looking at the same thing, but using the language of psychology side by side with the language of science. They're both describing the same experience, just using different language and from a different viewpoint. Let's talk about the first one, certainty or safety. The need that wants us to have some predictable certainty in our life, certainty that makes us feel safe and calm. So the neurochemicals that we talked about that go along with this need for calm and safety are acetylcholine and lower levels of adrenaline. But what about endorphins, the pain maskers? If we can't get our need for safety and certainty met by calming or offloading our adrenaline system, sometimes we choose to numb it, mask it, or distract from it with activities that stimulate endorphins. Things like long distance running, high intensity exercise, sex, laughter. Now, none of those activities are problematic in and of themselves, but do you know why you're doing those activities? What need are they trying to meet? None of these neurochemicals or the behaviors they drive are unhealthy by themselves. It's the when, for what reason, and how frequent aspects of its activation that's worth considering as well as whether your behavior is disruptive to other areas of our life and whether you have diverse enough ways of getting those needs met. Not having enough diversity in your life is a surefire way to become dependent on pretty much just about anything. Let's move on. How about variety or novelty? That's the need for the unknown, a need for some change and new stimulus. Now for this one, we've learned that adrenaline is active when we're experiencing something new, uncertain, or unknown. That's the travel effect we talked about. Something new is unknown. And anything unknown can either be scary, exciting, or adventurous, but it's all adrenaline-based. Endorphins can also play a role. Endorphins help us to keep chasing those short-term new goals and those feel-good effects of dopamine. Plus, remember, endorphins are also present with heightened awareness and anticipation. So endorphins are what we feel when we're looking forward to an anticipated vacation, and then adrenaline is at play when we're actually on the trip and experiencing something new for the first time. And if there's pleasure involved, well, you know that dopamine got dialed up as well. All right, how about significance? That feeling unique, important, special, or needed. Now, this need is one that we've learned is related to serotonin. There may be other hormones or neurochemicals that get activated as well, but serotonin is the main one associated with feeling like we matter. Next up, connection or love. That strong need for closeness or union with someone. Now, of course, here, you know we're gonna have oxytocin, maybe a small dose of adrenaline through energetic play and laughter, and possibly even acetylcholine when we're feeling really calm and relaxed in the presence of someone we know well. How about growth? We said this need was about expanding our capacity, expanding our capability, or increasing our understanding. Growth is also where we experience a sense of autonomy or freedom. Growth is about taking appropriate responsibility and beginning to feel more confident. So when we're really meeting this need, we may see an uptick in longer lasting serotonin and possibly even a little bit of dopamine as we progress and accomplish our goals. Growth can also be exciting and activate moderate amounts of adrenaline. But moderate doses of adrenaline here get activated as curiosity. So instead of adrenaline 
uh, be, you know, activating out of fear of the unknown, growth adrenaline is more about being interested in or curious about the unknown, especially when it comes to the world and people who look, live, and think differently than we do. And lastly, there's contribution, that sense of service and focus on helping, giving to, and supporting others. This go-giver attitude no doubt has elements of serotonin, oxytocin, longer periods of acetylcholine, and calm. We may still get some dopamine, but the activating stimulus, instead of being external, like for money or recognition, is more likely internal, providing that sense of satisfaction that comes from expression of our core values. Now, let's do some examples of getting our core four needs met in both high quality and low quality ways. So these four core needs that we've been talking about, certainty, variety, significance, or love and connection, they can be met in both destructive and polarizing ways, as well as helpful and unifying ways. For the purpose of this class, let's call ways that are helpful and unifying higher quality and we'll call ways that are unhelpful or polarizing lower quality. And realize that if several of these needs are getting met from the same source, overdependence and addiction can develop and it can be really hard to break away from. Let's run some examples. If I was part of a street gang in LA or a militant group in any country, one that maybe frequently robs stores sort of controlled the neighborhood or area and maybe even did drive-by shootings or shows of force. What needs are getting met here? Well, I can tell you that significance plays a big part. You can get a big boost of serotonin from being in control of or part of a group of like-minded people who admire and recognize you for your behavior. You feel like you matter. How about the need for certainty? A gang or militant group can be like a brotherhood or a family. They protect their own. So I can imagine there's a sense of safety there, especially if you live in a dangerous area. Anything else? How about the need for novelty or variety? Imagine living that sort of life, never knowing when you might die or be at the other end of a gun. So in a way, that meets a need for stimulus and a regular dose of adrenaline. Whether you call an experience excitement or fear, under the skin, it's still meeting the need neurochemically for adrenaline. Now, in this gang example, I don't know about the need for connection and love or growth, but I bet you could talk to members of these groups and some might say that they truly believe that they're contributing to a greater good in some way, depending on what the group's doctrine is. So, if we're only getting our needs met from one main source, even if it's a dangerous lower quality source like a violent gang, you can start to see why it can be really hard to get them away from it. That is, unless you offer a substitute to get these needs met, which is why inner city gyms, sport teams, youth centers, and et cetera, are so important. They offer new ways or additional ways to get these needs for mattering, safety, community, and stimulus met. And if you can offer connection and love on top of it, whoa, there's a better chance of getting them out of the gangs and into more helpful, high quality lifestyles. Okay, let's run another example, one that may be a little less obvious overperformance. We talked about this in the whole brain relationships course in a lot more detail, but we're gonna go over it again today here. We live and work in a world that rewards achievement and performance with money, admiration, and prestige. So many of us dedicate our lives to being busy, constantly learning, doing, and performing. And we get paid for it. We can afford a nice car. We get admired or recognized for it, and it feels great. And now you know more about why. Lots of dopamine and serotonin flowing with achievement and recognition. Plus, all that busyness and activity could either be meeting a need for stimulus or indirectly meeting a need for safety, certainty, and calm, especially if it's draining or offloading 
unmoderated adrenalines do it. So we create that behavior pattern. And next time that we feel a dip in our mood or we don't feel like we matter or are feeling anxious or not getting the acknowledgement that we need, what do overperformers do? We get busy again, learn more, do more, achieve more. That way we can get that feel good reward that comes with achievement, acknowledgement, admiration, and the dopamine hit that comes from accomplishing goals. Repeat it often enough without diversification and even working, achieving, and doing all the time can become a conditioned addictive habit. The problem is without conscious diversification of the ways you get these needs met, this conditioned habit of relying on activity, achievement, or busyness as a coping mechanism has potential to lead to burnout, relationship upheaval, and or health problems. Now, don't get me wrong. As I've said many times, there is nothing wrong with achievement, making money, getting acknowledgement, or even rewarding yourself for your efforts in moderate amounts. But it's worth asking yourself these questions. What's really driving you to do what you do? What need is it meeting? Is the way you're going about getting it met or the amount of time that you spend doing it healthy and helpful to the other areas of your life and your relationships? And do you have enough other resources in your life that can also meet this need? As we're gonna talk about here soon, there are many higher quality, more unifying ways we can get our needs met helpful ways that support our goals, both at work and in our personal life, but without becoming reliant on either one, burning out or sacrificing our health and relationships. Are you following me? There's nothing wrong with work or loving what you do for a living. But if it's the only place that you're getting your needs met for safety, calm, stimulus, variety, significance, or growth, you stand a chance of becoming dependent on it at the cost of other areas of your life. Think about that. If you're getting your needs met in only one place, why would you make time for friends? Why would you set boundaries on your work hours so you can date or put time into your family or marriage? And what do you think happens when someone who gets their needs met only through work then gets laid off, retires, tries to go on vacation? or something like COVID hits. How do you think that feels? Some people can barely relax on vacation or they suffer almost like withdrawal from lack of stimulus or from not being busy. They've become that dependent on what they do for a living as the only way to meet their needs. And then later, they wonder why they're alone or don't have many friends. So let's keep going and quickly do some less obvious real life examples so you can practice and sort of be like a detective and try to guess what needs are being met or trying to get met through certain behaviors. Let's start with constant talking or complaining. What need do you think is trying to get met here? Maybe significance, mattering, maybe even connection. Realize that people often do what they were modeled or learned as a way to connect or be seen. It's not always helpful or highly skilled. And sometimes it can even push people away, which can make some people feel safer. But even complainers are seeking to matter, feel significant, or feel safe in some way. They could just stand to learn a higher quality way of doing it. And if someone complains in order to feel significant, or a one-up sense of power, there's a chance they may have some conditioned thought patterns telling them that they're one down already and don't really matter to begin with. How about interrupting a conversation? What needs getting met there? Any significance, connection, stimulus? When I used to interrupt my husband a lot, it was in part because I didn't wanna forget what I wanted to say. I hadn't learned good listening skills growing up and I had to learn them as an adult. I grew up learning to believe that people who mattered 
or loud and talked a lot because they must have something valuable to say, <laughs> which isn't factual, but it's what I was modeled and therefore I adopted. My emotional nervous system also adopted a state of high adrenaline activation. So talking a lot was a behavior that met my need for safety or calm by offloading some of that excess adrenaline. Similar to overperforming, interrupting and talking a lot had become a coping mechanism that met a need to feel safe in my body. Talking and interrupting calmed me down by offloading some of that unmoderated adrenaline. But this was a low quality way of meeting this need because as an adult, it wasn't helping or unifying in my marriage and it didn't support my other goals either. As my emotional nervous system became more centered and as I add more helpful thought patterns and diversify how and where I get my serotonin, my sense of significance has increased a lot that need is getting met. Said another way, because I have diverse sources for, for, for both feeling significant and calming myself down when needed, I no longer need to always say something or interrupt to prove my value and calm myself down. I know my value and I'm calm to begin with, both in my mind and in my body which is another way of saying that I'm getting these needs met mentally and neurochemically. Let's do another. How about organization and planning? Well, I can see the need for certainty or safety and predictability being met, maybe even significance, like because you made a plan and then you met the goal. How about eating? What need does eating meet? I mean, you could say that satisfying hunger is meeting a need for safety, right? So it can also calm you down, right, through the vagus nerve. So that's something, that's another way to provide safety. How about the need for stimulus or variety, right? Some people eat to meet the need for stimulus too. Like maybe when you feel low energy and eating is something that you do just because you're bored, right? Is anyone else? eaten just because you're bored. <laughs> I have. But also simply enjoying a lot of different flavors in your food can be stimulating as well. How about this one? Parenting. Now that's a big source for meeting the needs for love, connection, stimulus, and mattering. Now remember what I mentioned happens when we get three or more of these needs met by only one source. It's really hard to break away from which is why parents can struggle when their kids leave the house or go to college. This is why it's really important for parents to take care of themselves and continue to have friendships, work, and get their needs met from a variety of sources other than just parenting. If you don't have diverse enough resources to get these needs met, you're really gonna struggle when your kids go on to lead their own lives. How about hanging on to a grudge or a past hurt? What need is trying to get met there? Safety, significance, like you feel powerful because you're holding on to a grudge, kind of like a one-up power play. How about withholding affection or stonewalling someone? I don't know, safety, significance, again, a sense of power. So when couples have power struggles, in many cases, they're desperately trying to get a need for emotional safety and significance met. They each want to know that they matter to each other and it's safe to show their weaknesses. They're simply doing it in unskilled, unhelpful ways. Learning to stay, this behavior hurt me, but you matter to me. Or you mean a lot to me, but don't do that hurtful thing again. Learning to relay those two sentiments to my husband as well as learning to recenter my emotional nervous system has made a huge difference in the recovery of our marriage. With a calmer, slower to activate emotional response, I can sit with him more easily as he uncomfortably talks about his weaknesses without a quick to activate emotional system putting a block between us. 
This ability to sit with and hear your partner's discomfort, shame, or embarrassment without your own emotional response hijacking the moment is what creates emotional safety between two people. How about gossiping? If you're part of a group who gossips, then I can see that meeting the need for connection, maybe even significance. And what about the need for variety and novelty? Yeah, gossip is a low quality way of getting all those needs met for sure. Last one, helping others. What do you think? Significance, community, contribution, reliable source of pleasure maybe? Sounds great. Now, can always helping others ever become problematic? I mean, it sounds like helping is sort of a gold mine of healthy need meeting, right? What about when your help isn't needed? Then what? Where else are you getting these needs met? Do you have other sources for feeling significant, for contribution, or for reliable pleasure and fun? What if by helping too much, you're actually blocking an opportunity for someone to learn, gain autonomy, or gain confidence in their own ability? I've been guilty of doing that. Helping someone when help is wanted is great, but helping all the time or using helping as your only source of getting a need for significance, contribution, or community met can not only rob someone of a chance to grow and do something for themselves, but if you're solely reliant on helping others in order to meet these needs and then your help isn't needed, or you're in a helping career field and then you retire, then what happens? See what I'm getting at? Diversification, it helps a lot here by giving you more than one source to draw from. What I really want you to get out of all of this is to start looking at your own behavior as well as other people's behavior, especially ones that are not helpful or unifying and wonder what need is not getting met here or what unmet need am I or that other person trying to meet? And is there a healthier, higher quality alternative that I can use or add in? A key point that I want you to take away is that whether we're skilled at getting our needs met or not, or whether we do it in low quality or high quality ways, we sort of all share this common biological design. And if you really want to see change in yourself, or if you really want to change a pattern of thinking or behaving, identify the need you're trying to meet, and then get creative. Start thinking, how can I add more diverse ways of getting that need met, or gradually work in some healthier substitutes for it? So let's wrap this up and talk about some higher quality ways to get our four core emotional needs met certainty, variety, significance, and connection, but doing it without sacrificing other areas of our life, without becoming dependent on only one source, and without activating excess amounts of cortisol. Let's begin with healthy ways to meet our need for certainty, safety, or calm. In other words, how to activate acetylcholine. We can meet the need for safety and calm and activate acetylcholine with activities like meditation, yoga, listening to music, slow stroke swimming, or anything that activates the vagus nerve, nerve with deep, slow breathing, or anything that also involves your senses. Did any of you else have one of those worry stones growing up? That smooth river stone that you could rub between your thumb and finger to calm yourself? You know why it works? Because focusing on touch or the smooth finger sensation of that stone, even for a few minutes, shifts your brain from thinking to tactile body sensing, which elicits acetylcholine. Coloring, painting, gardening, hiking, anything that gets you into your physical body at a relaxed rate and away from your thinking brain can activate acetylcholine. So are there any calming sources that we need to watch out for? You bet. Realize that smoking, alcohol, or any other sedative, what it's doing is depressing or calming your nervous system 
because your nervous system doesn't know how to do it on its own yet. So if you're always using these substitutes, then your system is not going to learn. Think about the example of teaching a kid to make his bed. You can do it for him or her and say, this is how you make a bed. But if you really want them to learn to do it themselves, you have to let them practice doing it themselves. It's the same with teaching your body to calm itself. I know it's hard, especially when you're used to getting quick relief from things like alcohol or smoking, but maybe consider trying first to relax in another way. Give yourself like 30 minutes to listen to relaxing music or breathe slowly and deeply before you have that glass of wine or beer. Next, let's cover higher quality ways of meeting the need for variety or novelty or how to get moderate amounts of adrenaline. Hearty laughter, raucous play, sport, physical activity, fostering cura curiosity of something or someone unknown, doing something new and different, learning a new hobby, travel somewhere foreign. Realize that fear and excitement have the same neurochemical base in our bodies, adrenaline. So whether you view something as scary or exciting is really a matter of conditioned association, which you can change. And what about adrenaline sources that we need to watch out for? Well, high risk activities or anything that puts your life in obvious danger, activities that keep your adrenal system spiked for long periods of time. Now you know how that affects our cortisol levels or any activity that breaches agreed upon boundaries of your relationships either at work or at home. Moving on, let's talk about meeting our need for significance and mattering, or what are higher quality ways that we can boost serotonin? Be part of a group. It doesn't have to be a big one, and it can be social, like a book club or through meetup, and it can be work-related. If you're not in the habit of socializing, that's okay. You don't have to be or act any differently than what feels comfortable. COVID really hit us hard in the serotonin department, especially when we couldn't physically see each other in person and we were still learning how to connect using services like Zoom. And when we consider the impact of not getting that need for community recognition and significance met, we can start to see how people can get drawn into fear-based polarizing groups in the same way that others are drawn into more unifying and helpful groups. Both type groups are looking to get a need for significance and connection met, which is a commonality we all share, but the quality of the choices can be far different. Number two, reflect on your past achievements. This is super easy and allows your brain to go over and relive a prior experience where you felt significant, where you made a difference. Our brains have a hard time telling the difference between what you imagine and what is real. So it produces serotonin either way. So if you're needing a little boost during a stressful day, kick back and think about something in your past when you've done well and or where you felt like you contributed to something in helpful ways. Next up, gratitude practice. At the end of each day before we go to sleep, my husband and I go over what we're thankful for. It may sound a little trite, but being thankful for what we have not only gets our brains into the now and out of that anxious fear-based state, but it's a gentle reminder that we've each done well in areas of our life in ways we kind of take for granted sometimes. Our home, the easy access to food, clean water, our health. This short reflection at the end of your day can give your brain a mini dose of serotonin right before you drift off to sleep. Get outside. The impacts of sun exposure related to seasonal affect has been studied for quite a long time now. By exposing your body to UV light, this promotes vitamin D production. This vitamin has many roles, one of which is promoting serotonin production. And lastly, doing the personal work to neutralize any old beliefs that may be blocking you from recognizing your own worth. That can't help but support serotonin. Once you can comprehend how significant your existence really is, even without doing or saying anything to prove it, 
you'll already have this ready, continuous source of serotonin simply by knowing your own value. All right, so serotonin hits that we need to watch out for. Well, as we mentioned earlier, our body can't distinguish between healthy community and unhealthy community. So having status or significance in a criminal gang that honors loyalty can get the same serotonin relief as someone who is part of an environmental support group. And as I'm sure that we've all witnessed, polarizing fear-based groups can attract even the most highly intelligent individuals. And it can become a self-reinforcing pattern if you're not careful. Bottom line, be mindful who you hang out with to get your need for significance and serotonin met. And consider getting it met from more than one source. All right, last of the four core needs is our need for bonding, connection, and love, which is represented in the body by oxytocin, the trust-building neurotransmitter. So let's look at some higher quality ways we can meet this need. Number one, and the most obvious, is hugs, cuddling, and affection. They're key. So go for several hugs a day when you can. Number two, pets. I love my dog, but personally, I feel that humans give the best hugs back. But hugging or petting your pet can yield a similar boost of oxytocin. Giving small gifts, such as handwritten notes to your partner and helping with the to-do chore list, that can give someone in your life an oxytocin boost. Even honoring the birthday of a colleague at work with a simple card will cause oxytocin levels to rise. How about social bonding? Sharing a meal with someone, having a meaningful conversation or working together on a project. Those are all great sources of oxytocin. And of course, don't undervalue the less tangible ways to give oxytocin, like listening deeply, especially without trying to suggest a solution but simply allowing yourself to share their emotional experience in that moment. Witnessing someone else process their painful emotions, sitting there uncomfortably through it, sends the message that you see them, they matter, and what they're experiencing is real. And it can result in a whopping dose of trust building oxytocin. So oxytocin kind of sounds like we can't have enough of it, right? Is there? ever really such a thing as too much oxytocin? Well, we know from research that oxytocin's bonding benefit reinforces the positive feelings that we already feel towards the people we love. And it increases our affection for them, which is great for loyalty and monogamy. But oxytocin bonding at its extreme is not always positive. In high amounts, research has linked oxytocin with behaviors such as possessiveness, jealousy, and ethnocentrism, which loosely means if we only surround ourselves with people who do things like we do, then it may increase our dislike for those who do it differently. So similar to dopamine, oxytocin is really at its best in moderate amounts and from a diverse set of resources. When it comes to dopamine and endorphin, I haven't read anything yet that says they directly correspond to one of our psycho-emotional needs, but I do see them as sort of helper hormones, neurochemicals that can help us get our basic six needs met faster and with greater consistency. In other words, if something meets a need and feels good, there's a greater chance we're gonna seek it out again, right? Especially if we can do it quickly. So because they play such an important role, let's take a quick look at healthy, higher quality ways that you can activate them. Dopamine. Your first strategy is to break big goals down into little pieces. Instead of allowing your brain to secrete a large burst of dopamine when you achieve a major goal, choose to celebrate several smaller goals along the way. This activates smaller, more frequent releases. Next. Create a new goal before achieving the, your current goal. This way you establish a more consistent pattern of dopamine release because they kind of overlap. Number three, celebrate your small wins. Those little goals that we mentioned in the first one, acknowledge them. Give yourself a moment to say a private like, woohoo, 
woohoo, or give yourself a little pat on the back. Every time it activates a little boost of dopamine. See, I just gave myself one. <laughs> and finally, consider giving dopamine hits to other people. Acknowledging your partner, child, or friend by giving them small doses of praise benefits you as well as the receiver. Noticing small acts of kindness or generosity activates a dopamine release and motivates that person to repeat the behavior. Now, as an employer and leader, recognizing improvements and tasks that are done well are great dopamine triggers. Don't underestimate the power of sending an encouraging email or vocalizing a subtle way to go to someone who has done solid work. These are small, easy gestures that will increase productivity as well as future motivation. However, we still need to pay attention when it comes to this highly addicting neurochemical. Remember, dopamine is the instant gratification chemical, which makes it handy sometimes because it's quick and easy to activate, but it can also become addictive. So enjoy those kind, those kind words like that you get from your coworkers or friends but be mindful of how much you rely on that validation from others to feel good. As we already mentioned, dopamine effects are short-lived and fleeting. And because we're imperfect humans, well, we don't always behave consistently. So depending on other people's affirmation as your only source of dopamine can become problematic when people in your life fail to supply it consistently. Addiction can develop from a reliance on any external dopamine activator. Things like video games that keep you moving on to higher levels and social media likes, they seem har harmless at first, and they are harmless in small to moderate amounts or as a part of a diversified set of ways to get dopamine. But relying on only one of those sources can lead to a never ending cycle of chasing affirmation through overachievement, overpleasing, and performing just to get praise. Research also supports that although dopamine in moderate doses helps us enjoy food, exciting events, and to enjoy our relationships, elevated amounts sourced only from one person have also been correlated to erratic behavior, jealousy, and adultery. And finally, Let's talk about endorphins. So other than relieving or masking pain, are there some high quality ways that we can boost this neurochemical? Yep, sure is. First off is laughter. This is one of the easiest ways to get a quick release of endorphin. We also talked about laughter earlier when we were talking about healthy adrenaline. So now you know the physical reason behind the phrase, laughter is the best medicine. We get two feel good body boost from one activity. Now, occasionally you'll meet someone who is a nervous laugher or someone who laughs in inappropriate situations. Sometimes in stressful situations, laughter is a way for people to feel better in the moment. We've probably all done that at some point. So if you witness that in someone else, try to be empathetic. It may be because they're looking for a quick way to relieve discomfort or stress. Next, Embrace the unknown. Doing or learning something new, traveling to a new place, anything where there's anticipation and a buildup to an unknown conclusion. Cultivate a spirit of adventure. It's only a matter of practice to learn to view the unknown in this way. And finally, although I won't even try to explain the mechanism behind it, research studies have shown that an increase in endorphin um, goes up with eating spicy food and dark chocolate. Yay, I love both of those things. So what are some endorphin hits that we still need to watch out for? Well, food again, because research also shows that endorphins can be released with food that we have a positive association with, like pizza or fried chicken, yum, right? Combined with the calming effects of digestion, you can see why obesity can easily develop from too much comfort eating. If eating is the only coping mechanism for masking discomfort and calming ourselves, it can easily become an overused system that gets stuck in an unhealthy pattern. 
Now, some other coping strategies that you may be familiar with are gambling, pornography, opioids. All of these can be powerfully addictive pain maskers that when paired with dopamine has potential to damage relationships, damage your health, or upset your finances. And finally, similar to adrenaline, high risk activities that seek out anticipation of possible death or that could damage your relationships, unhealthy sources for activating endorphins. So to sum all this up, our challenge is to find ways to moderate and differentiate our adrenaline use, increase our serotonin, oxytocin, and acetylcholine activation, and do it with activities that give us more diverse, high quality, relationship enhancing substitutes for dopamine. The reason that I advocate for doing the work to retrain your emotional response is in addition to using higher quality coping strategies to manage it, is that this middle zone of emotional activation right here, once we retrain it to become our home base of emotional experience, this is where we routinely feel calm, confident, and connected on an average day-to-day -day basis. In other words, it's where we're, get, we're getting a lot of our neurochemical needs met. And when this moderate activation state right here becomes our default or what our system is used to and runs automatically, this is where we can really learn to thrive. So that wraps it up. This class was created for you for free, but if you found it interesting or helpful and would like to support our mission, um, a donation in any amount to the wellness assistance grant is greatly appreciated. 100% of today's presentation donation goes to this grant, but if finances are tight, I understand. I'm just glad you're here. Now, if you want to learn more about our neurochemical and behavioral needs, I learned a ton from Dr. Loretta Bruning and the Inner Mammalian Institute, but also just from reading a lot of research. I know I've given you a lot to take in and many things to think about. But what's most important is to just start asking yourself this one question. Whenever you find yourself acting, behaving, or considering an unhelpful behavior, or even if you see someone else acting poorly, just ask what need is not getting met that's trying to get met with this behavior? And what are some higher quality ways I can do it? Diversifying your sources helps a lot. But ultimately, increasing your awareness, interrupting your behavior patterns, and slowly exchanging how you meet your needs with higher quality choices will help you feel a lot safer and calmer in your body on a regular day-to-day -day basis.